Hey guys, welcome to video 15 for unit 1.3. This video series follows the biology coloring book by Robert D. Griffin, and today we're going to take a look at cell theory and the fluid mosaic model. Cell theory is the idea in science that describes how the cell is essential to living things. It tells us that the cell is the basic unit of life, and that all living things are made of cells, and that those cells come from pre-existing cells. But let's elaborate a little bit. When we say that all living things are made of cells, what we really mean is that every known organism is made up of one or more cells. There are single-celled organisms like bacteria or protists, and then there's the multicellular organisms like you or a rabbit or a dog. This picture is a picture of a biofilm. It looks like it's a single organism composed of lots and lots of cells, but in fact, it's actually a mass of single-celled bacteria. Biofilms are formed when bacteria colonies grow to cover a huge region, and sometimes they're even visible to the naked eye. An example of a biofilm is what is referred to as scum that grows on your teeth. So when you wake up in the morning and you feel like there's this film covering your teeth, that's actually a biofilm that's made up of billions of individual bacteria cells. So would it kill you to brush your teeth every once in a while? Cells are also called the basic unit of life because they're the basic unit of structure and function in living things. So here's a rabbit made up of trillions and trillions of cells, but each of those cells belongs to a particular kind of tissue. So, for example, cells that make up bone tissue, tissue, which are called osteocytes, have a particular structure because of their job as part of the support system for the animal's body. Red blood cells have another type of structure because they have the function of circulating nutrients in the blood. Muscle cells have still yet a third kind of structure because muscles have to flex and create movement. So, even though the animal's body seems to have all of these different structures and functions, they really boil down to the individual structures and functions of the, of the cells that make up the bunny's body. The activity of an organism depends on the total activity of independent cells. And to help us learn about this idea, I have a special guest. Mr. Schwarzenegger? Welcome to the great state of California. Notice that Mr. Schwarzenegger is flexing his muscles. Now, it's tempting to think of that activity as being something that Mr. Schwarzenegger is doing on his own. But if we look closer, what we would find is that flexing of muscles is really brought about, brought about by the coordinated action of millions of cells. And thinking is another example of coordinated action of millions of cells. The activity of your brain, maybe the activity that you think of as being your mind, is brought about by the activity of all of your brain cells. They work in more or less a coordinated fa fashion to allow your brain to function the way it does. Energy flow, metabolism, and biochemistry occurs in the cell. So even though we like to think of ourselves as having our own particular metabolism as a single multicellular organism, it's actually the metabolic activity of individual cells that brings that about. For example, this diagram shows how a cell can bring in glucose, and through a really chem complicated chemical reaction, Use that glucose to produce energy. Every single cell in your body is doing this at a pretty constant rate. And if it ever didn't happen that way, well then your metabolism would be zero. And 
you'd be dead, unless you're some kind of robot. Cells also contain hereditary information, called DNA, which is passed from cell to cell during cell division. The cells that I've circled here in red are in the process of dividing the copied DNA that will be used to start new cells when the cells divide into two. All cells are basically the same in chemical composition in organisms of the same species, meaning that if I looked at the brain cells of this bunny, they would be pretty similar in structure and composition to the brain cells of this other bunny. So they're pretty much the same bunny. The last thing we need to talk about is an idea called the fluid mosaic model. It describes the structure of the cell membrane and helps to explain how the cell membrane acts as a selectively permeable membrane to allow good things to move into the cell, but to keep bad things out of the cell. So remember how we talked last week about phospholipids. We talked about their composition. There's two fatty acid tails that make one end of the phospholipid hydrophilic, not hydrophilic, hydrophobic, whereas the top end of the phospholipid is hydrophilic because it has a phosphate group and a polar group. We also learned how they spontaneously form phospholipid bilayers when they're in water. Well, it turns out that the cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. It's a phospholipid bi bilayer that also includes chunks of protein and carbohydrates and cholesterol in it. And each of these items that are embedded in the phospholipid bilayer have a particular role. Some of them, like cholesterol, act as binding agents to keep the phospholipid bilayer intact. Others, like proteins, can be chemical signalers communicating between one cell and another. Or they can be parts of the cytoskeleton that let the cell move and maintain its shape. Or they can be protein channels that help pull things into or push them out of the cell. Because the cell's phospholipid bilayer is pretty fluid, and you should think of bubbles of oil and water, they're not hard or rigid, they pretty much flex and uh, easily move around. And because that phospholipid bilayer is embedded with lots of chunks of proteins and other things, we call it the fluid mosaic model. Fluid because it's able to flow. Mosaic because it's got chunks of stuff. Like as if it was a mosaic made out of pieces of tile or something. By the way, what would you call a mosaic that was made out of a cow? A mosaic, because it's made out of a cow. Cows say moo. So the cell membrane allows for the transport of materials into and out of the cell. Generally speaking, we're talking about bringing in useful items and then pushing out items that are not useful, like metabolic wastes, for example. Cells do this by a couple of different processes. The first is passive transport, which is passive because it doesn't require any energy from the cell. The reason it doesn't require energy is that passive transport happens when items move through or across the cell membrane using simple diffusion. This happens for small molecules because there are small spaces between the phospholipids. So ions, like the components of salt or water molecules, can pass through those small spaces between phospholipids. For larger items, like starches or proteins, for example, the cell might need to provide a protein channel, which is like a big open space in the cell membrane 
where larger items can pass through. But again, this happens with diffusion. So the items are going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. Active transport requires cellular energy because here the cell is going to move substances against the concentration gradient, against diffusion. In other words, active transport moves substances from low concentration to a high concentration. Consider how a cell might need food items from the outside environment. A cell is not likely to find food items in a high concentration outside, but it really needs to have a high concentration of those food items inside the cell in order for its metabolism to work efficiently. In order to accumulate those items inside the cell, the cell has to use energy and special proteins called transport proteins to bring those substances in. That's the end of this video. Please complete the corresponding review questions and make sure that you're prepared to show me your notes in class. And here's your bunny of the day.